Well, a certain general has been up to no good. He has undermined one president and pandered to another. He has openly sworn allegiance to radical political ideologies. He's been inappropriately partisan. He has uh, violated important values. He's insulted millions of Americans who, who hold to those values. He likely colluded with one of our enemies, maybe even committing treason. I'm actually not talking about today's guest, although that's how the media has depicted him. I'm actually talking about General Milley, who just happens to have fashionable politics, so nobody says anything. He wants the woke military, so he's been celebrated. He's been applauded for his political grandstanding. I mean, it's only a matter of time before he gets nominated for a Nobel Prize or an Oscar. Uh, Unfortunately, today's guest is a general with the wrong politics. In better times, he would be known as a remarkable man with a ton of accomplishments. He should be seen as an example of what an American can accomplish. But because of the times we live in, he and his family have lived through hell. He has been repeatedly slandered and demonized, harassed, defamed, forced to, uh, to wear the scarlet letter. He's been banned on Twitter. Even his bank has canceled his credit cards and accounts because continuing the relationship creates a possible reputational risk, does it? Perhaps most of all, he was targeted by the FBI for several years with the guidance of James Comey himself. Russia, Russia, Russia. Remember when that's all we ever talked about? Well, today's guest was an early victim of Russiagate. He was the guinea pig, the scapegoat. He was the doorway to the president. In the Democratic's political game, they had endless hatred and had to remove Donald Trump from the White House by any means necessary. And they had to get him first. Democrats had gone to great lengths to gain power, and they got it. It's all theirs. And now they've moved on. But that's not the way justice works. We're learning more and more about the truth of the Russia hoax. It's scandalous, to say the least. In April, documents were released proving the FBI really did target today's guest. That was their goal, to get him to lie so we can prosecute him or get him fired to get to Trump. Had some pretty controversial guests on this podcast. One of the biggest reasons I started it is to have a conversation that you can't find anywhere else. In an era that punishes people who disagree with the, with the norms of today. Even by those standards, today's guest is uh, at a level of controversy that is hard to even quantify. He's a household name. You say his name to anyone and you will get a response and it's usually intense one way or the other. So today, welcome my podcast guest, General Michael Flynn. <laughs> Flynn, it's an honor to have you. True honor. Thanks. Thank you so much for having me on, Glenn. I really appreciate it. Appreciate your audience. I appreciate what you have done, uh, you know, throughout your life, but also what you're doing for this country on a daily basis to really get the truth out. Thank you. I will tell you, and I want to get to this later, but I was, I was shocked at the boldness of the setup of you. Um, the way Mm -hmm. all of this went down. And I think this podcast is so important because if they can do this to a three-star general and they can do it to the president of the United States and nobody seems to pay for it, what makes the average American think they're not going to do it to them? Right. And they do it to the average American people all the time, Glenn. The, the, you know, I I call it the department of injustice or the just us department. Mm. Um, that they, they do it to people all the time. Uh, I think the boldness, the boldness that, that America witnessed was not just the president of the United States, Donald Trump, but, you know, and, and it's not just a three-star general who served, you know, three and a half decades in the military, five years in combat. It was the national security. I was a national security advisor at the time, you know, one of the closest security advisors to the president of the United States. 
But really, Glenn, what uh, what the people in Washington, D.C., the deep state and all these characters that are now being held unaccountable, what they don't realize is that they did it to the American people because the American people don't, you know, they they might love the man, Donald Trump and all that, but they they believe in the Constitution and the presidency of this country. And they actually attacked the presidency, a duly elected president. So therefore, they were attacking the American people. And that's what these bureaucrats and these deep staters in Washington, D.C. don't get. And they still don't get it. Every time they attack me, they attack them. I, I will tell you that I, um, I, I don't think the American people are who, well, I know they're not, who the press think they are. Um, but the one thing that, that I know to be true is, had Donald Trump colluded and taken money from the Russians and all of that, his base would have turned on him. They're, you know, they, they, oh, yeah. they love Donald Trump, but they also have a sense of fairness and right and wrong. And, and when the left dismisses what happened to Donald Trump and mocks it and laughs about it, um, half of the country is very upset because it shows that they um, are not just against policies or politics. They are against the principles that have always driven this country that, quite honestly, maybe we've been naive, but a lot of Americans still believe in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, here's my my uh, my thing these days with people as I go around and I talk to different groups of people about everything about this country. We, my father, my mother, they handed off to my generation, to me and my brothers and sisters, a, a pretty great country. My generation, this is why it's. I don't blame the kids. I don't blame the you know grandkids that I have. I actually look at my generation and I say we screwed this up because something that that you just implied certainly is we've taken this for granted. And mm -hmm. we, have, we have taken everything that we have for granted in this country. And now all of a sudden we're realizing that for about, you know, probably about 30 years. So the, the second half of my life, the, there has been a shift in everything, education system, our government, and you know, the financial system, everything that's going on. And now we suddenly see the boldness of what just happened in this previous election, in the 2020 election for the presidency. We've had we've had fraudulent elections for over well over 100 years. It goes back to the Tammany Hall days in New York City and uh, certainly in Chicago. But what the, the boldness uh, that we just witnessed was they finally decided, you know what, we're just going to go for the for the gusto here, the full gusto. and We're going to take over the country. And so now what we see and, and I don't know what you want to get into. But I mean, I, you know, the, the rhyme and verse about some of the issues in these latest bills that they're going to pass and they're going to put additional burdens on the American people. My, my thing, Glenn, my life, and this is where they were afraid of me. My life has been uh, certainly military and I can go back, you know, in, in all the years of, you know, the tactical stuff that I did. But the second half of my career, I really got into the more the senior leadership of the U.S. intelligence community. And I really began to understand the strategy and the policies that our country was getting itself involved in all over the world. I mean, I was very against, uh, and I said it publicly, I, you know, later on in my, in my, uh, in my life, uh, certainly when I became a civilian, I very outspoken about the decision to go into Iraq, as an example. One of the, one of the greatest strategic failure type decisions that we have had certainly this century, because it's, mm. it caused so much mayhem and, and, and confusion and, and, uh, and frankly, uh, you know, the, the death of, of many American uh, service members. And uh, so anyway, my, my life has been around that sort of stuff. And so all of a sudden I get involved in the political life of the country. I, I get, uh, I meet with Donald Trump. We connect, we have this great connection. I was, you know, I got to help him out in the, in the election run up to 2016. And boy, I'm going to tell you the the, uh, you know, the quote unquote deep state, the intelligence community, particularly the intelligence community and specifically the CIA, uh, you know, people came after me. Uh, certainly the, the, the Clinton machine machinery uh, came after me uh, because when you're the national security advisor uh, for the United States of America, not just for the country or, or for the uh, a president, uh, because I've always seen myself as somebody who 
is all about country first. Mm-hmm. You know, my faith is is certainly super important, but country first, and then the and then the person, right? Uh, you know, if I didn't think that the that Donald Trump was going to ask me to do something uh, legal, ethical, or moral, I would tell him uh, that 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 I I'm you know I'm going to throw my stars down, so to speak, and walk out the door because it's always about country. What's best for the country? What's best for our constitution? And and I know that um, the things that I would have become aware of, the things that I am aware of. The, uh, the, the, the bastions of, of corruption inside of uh, our federal government, particularly the United States government, Washington, D.C., they, they did not want me uh, mucking around in their world. Uh, okay, so let me ask you this. Let me go back government. a bit. Is it because when you were DIA, um, you were very outspoken on Islamicists, yep. different than Islamic Islamicist is is a very specific term Much and different. a very and a very uh, dangerous uh, uh, element that we have to deal with. You were very very clear on that. Was that something that you think was the beginning of their hatred towards you? Yes, absolutely. And uh, because I pushed back on a number of uh, what we call these national intelligence estimates. That are all, you know, inside that there's this inside baseball yeah. um, on on uh, the situation in Afghanistan, the situation in Iraq, the situation in in uh, in our fight against Al Qaeda. The, you know, when the when the message was bin Laden's dead, Al Qaeda's on the run. That was not the, re- the the that was not reality. That did not reflect reality that we knew to be true. And I'm a guy coming off the battlefield in my life in the military is really to try to help us win not participate in wars. And that could be another discussion if you want to go down that rat hole. But I, I will tell you that uh, I, I was I was very I was outspoken, but I but I was outspoken inside of the chain of command. Right. Okay? So mm-hmm. I never went out and, you know, and went to the media and, you know, and did anything like that. I, I was very loyal to the Constitution, to my chain of command. And I would tell them, hey, this is not right. This is and I would push back and I wasn't going to I wasn't going to be somebody who was going to be told, well, you just need to, you know, shut up and go away, uh, because I was, uh, you know, I said no, I, I'm not going to sign off on one of these estimates that the intelligence community puts out that says that, you know, the, you know, the entire intelligence community agrees that this happened, and I was going to be one of those people that wasn't going to do it because we knew my agency at the time knew that that wasn't the case, and in fact, when we were saying, when the when the uh, political leaders were saying. Uh, bin Laden's dead. Al Qaeda's on the run. Al Qaeda was actually rising, and I think at that time, if I have the numbers right, I think that they were growing in like 24 nations around the greater uh, Islamist world that you mm. highlighted. And um, you know, you fa- you then fast forward after I got out of the military, and I wrote a book called The Field of Fight, and it's a national bestseller. And uh, The Field of Fight, where I called out. This was after I got out of out of uniform. I called out the Obama administration because I was I was really deathly afraid, you know, of what uh, we were allowing to happen, that we were allowing the growth of this radical form of Islamism. And and I'm going to tell you, Glenn, it's still it's still oh, uh, growing and it's on the move. Oh, I think, yeah, I think in, we're in, headed in, uh, for real trouble. Um, I want to get to that here in a, in a second. Um, the media will not leave you alone. Last week, I think it was the salad right. dressing, uh, dressing story that they were putting, that you had said that they were putting the vaccine in salad dressing. And I mean, it's ridiculous. I was re- yeah, I was reading an article. It is ridiculous. I was on a, I was on a great podcast with a, with a friend and, and uh, Thrive Time USA. And, uh, and there was an article, we were talking about a totally different issue, we, but he right away started off with what, whatever was in the news that day about the uh, the latest uh, message coming out of the White House on COVID vaccines. And I said, have you seen this article uh, where the California Institute of Technology in Santa Barbara, California, is actually studying that? And I just so so I said that I said, have you seen this article where they're talking about putting some sort of vaccine into into our salads? And I, and I like as a because it was an article that I read that morning. And so now the media is like, well, he's a conspiracy theorist. Now he's telling us that every he's telling all these people that we're going to have it in, you know, in our, in our, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Salad, yeah. Our <laughs> you know, I got to tell you, if you're trying to get the people who are anti-vaxxers to do it, you got to put it in some sort right. of a steak sauce. We don't eat salads. 
Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, the this yeah, the, they're after me, Glenn. They're definitely after me. Oh, I know they are. The story that uh, the Citibank um, stopped your family Chase. from doing well, Chase Chase Manhattan. Um, and, Chase. And Chase. they were the ones that um, uh, stopped your family from doing business with the bank because of they felt it would do reputational harm. Is that true? And what's yeah, the whole story? Yeah, so great. I appreciate you asking about this. It's Chase Bank. We had two accounts. They sent us a letter and it was a very curt, you know, curt letter. And the letter said, and I posted it online. The letter said that would you represent reputational risk there, you know, Flynn family. We had two accounts that were that were uh, basically they closed them. Um, and they would no no longer do business with them. We never missed a payment in those accounts. Uh, you know, my 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 credit, you know, has is is really superb. Always has been. I've been one of these guys that my wife and I, you know, we pay all of our bills on time. Always did with these two accounts. So then all of a sudden we get this letter and my wife is like really upset about it. And it was embarrassing. And, uh, you know, f and I'm like reputational risk. And so, um, you know, Chase Bank, and I think we had those accounts for about 10 years. So Chase Bank doesn't want to have us do business anymore. But then one of the things I said to my wife, I go, so what's that, what's that mean? You know, we talked about it because we kind of do our own little family finance stuff. And I said, I said, so. Uh, do they still want us to pay the annual fee? You know, do they still want us to have this thing and pay the annual fee? So I told my wife, I said, F you know, cancel those damn things right now. We're not paying these guys another dime. And I'm really upset about this. And I'm going to make it a public thing. Because so I put it out on, on my social media mm -hmm. because I was just really irritated that, you know, and then one of their excuses was that Flynn is a common name. And it was an operational oversight and should have never happened because Flynn is a common name. I kid you not. That I have on record. So, um, you know, Flynn's not a common name. And, and certainly Michael Flynn, anybody that understands banking and records and how they do these kinds of things, they, they got to make a conscious decision about this. So I, I, am, I am upset about it. It was embarrassing. Um, it should never happen. And now we're here we are on the on uh, Blaze TV talking about it. And I know, I know that many millions of Americans, and may maybe that number's, maybe I'm um, um, saying too much there, but I, it's not maybe millions, but it's certainly people that heard about this, because I've been contacted by people who have big accounts with Chase, who said, I just want to confirm with you because I'm no longer going to do business with Chase. And I said, yep, that's, that happened. And here's what I think happened. And there's my two cents. And, and so, Chase made a huge error because like like Washington, D.C. So, does sometimes and the mainstream media does sometimes they don't get the sentiment of the American people and, and how many American people got behind my family. And I and I've said this elsewhere, Glenn, the American people, you know, for the last four years of five years of my life have been buddy breathing with me and my family to help us survive because they felt such an affront because as you said up, uh, as you said at the beginning of the show, if they can do this to me, they can do this to them. And I know that there have been people that have come to me, particularly in my family, that have given us their 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 sort of life story about how the Department of Justice went after them just because they could. And the Department of Justice, and I'll say it here, as I've said it publicly, uh, they they are all about convictions and not the truth. That's what they're the Department of Justice, particularly the. The attorney, uh, you know, if they, they'll watch this because they're watching everything that I do and they're going to go, oh, that son of a gun, Flynn, there he goes again. Well, you know what? Quit, quit seeking conviction and let's help find the truth. That's what you're supposed to do as a lawyer. Uh, and if you're a prosecutor, you know, don't prosecute. Let's, we got massive problems with illegal immigration. We got massive problems with still with the opioid crisis and drug cartels bringing drugs into this country. We got massive you know, we have massive corruption inside of our own government. We have massive problems overseas. Focus on the problems that our country actually has to deal with instead of kowtowing to the political left in this country and doing their bidding. If you're a lawyer of any salt, that's what you need to do. I will tell you, um, General, that I'm one of those families that stood with you. We don't do business with Chase, nor will I ever do business with Chase um, because of that. This is That was a 
very, very disturbing um, thing that I yeah. honestly don't think was an was an accident. But um, let me no. let me go to how we got here. Um, the the first of all, tell me personally what it was like to go through this Russia witch hunt. What did it feel like to you? Yeah, it was horrible. It was a horrible sense of of betrayal by uh, our own United St- elements within our own U.S. government. A huge, huge betrayal, and everything that we know now, uh, and we're and we're finding out more and more. And I think that this this latest indictment on this Sussman character. So every day, more more evidence comes out of the of the betrayal, not just of me. I, my, you know, I. I mean, I'm, I'm a pretty upbeat guy, honestly, and I, you know, I'm not a vindictive. I don't want to have hate in my heart, Glenn. Mm-hmm. Um, but they, they, uh, they betrayed. They being, the, you know, elements of our federal government, the Justice Department, the intelligence community, um, people that were in our uh, White House, our previous White House, previous to, to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, to uh, Donald Trump. They betrayed me. Therefore, they betrayed our country. And um, so it was really hard. It was really, really hard. From the Federalists, there's five points uh, that they bring up on this Sussman thing. Um, And they say, fifth prevalent rejoinder played over the last week involved invoking the name of Michael Flynn. Even if true, the Washington Post editorial board wrote, the Sussman episode is far less alarming than the case of former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn. What, what 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 is it what is it that they claim still that you did i mean the the evidence is yeah, it's, clear it's incredible. you know one of the one of the fascinating components of this story one of the the senior agents fbi agents by the name of barnett and you can go pull this up unless they've taken it all down october of 2020 so the name barnett who's an fbi agent very senior guy and he was one of the lead agents for Crossfire Hurricane. <clears throat> Crossfire Hurricane was the, uh, the investigation with this whole Russia gate, right? So Agent Barnett in October of 2020. So, so uh, you know, just out a year ago now, October 2020, after oh, the Mueller investigation's over with, my case had been dismissed by the Department of Justice after a special counsel investigated the, the investigators, so to speak, and found egregious government misconduct. Uh, the Department of Justice says case dismissed. In October, that was in May of 2020. In October of 2020, so fast forward about whatever that is, four or five months, Barnett gives a uh, essentially a deposition, an affidavit, a 302, and it's about nine pages. In that 302, which is really, really uh, stunning, he basically says the entire effort, the entire crossfire hurricane effort was get Flynn to get Trump. And that's the senior and one of the lead agents, Barnett is his name, for Crossfire Hurricane. So for all of this, they just love to bring in the disgraced former national security advisor, lied to the FBI, and then had to get a pardon by Trump. They leave out all the stuff in the middle. You know, the, the lying to the FBI, I didn't lie to the FBI. The FBI changed the 302. And, what is and a, three, what's a, three, what's fact, a 302? Okay, yeah, good, good. Yeah, 302 is a is a document. So if you get interviewed by the FBI, they write it down in something called a three a 302, which is a document that the FBI uses to capture the essence of a conversation that they have with anybody. Got it. So anybody that the FBI talks to, they're supposed to write a 302. It's kind of like an affidavit. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a legal binding document. And so, you know, they don't have to record their call, their conversations. So they they took notes, and we now have uh, the majority of those notes from that meeting. And they said they, during that meeting, they said, I didn't lie. Um, they then changed the, the outcome of the 302. Normally, a 302 is supposed to be done within five days. They were still messing around with mine. I think it was four or five months later, where Andy McCabe, before he was fired by Trump, was still mucking around with it. So, so we now know that they changed the 302. They changed the, the tone of the conversation that I had with those FBI agents. They, they, they admitted that I didn't lie to them. Um, you know, I, I mean, I, I, at the time I had, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, when I'm in my last days or my last day with Trump, and I think Trump felt very uncomfortable, and he and I have had many conversations 
since then, since my since my pardon, because I didn't talk to Trump. I hadn't talked to Trump once from the night I left the White House until the day that he called me up and said, hey, I got to give you a pardon here. And, I, and, I, and it's called a pardon of innocence, Glenn. Um, it's really not something that's normally given because I wasn't guilty of anything. I was never convicted right. of anything. Right. Um, so th- this is what's stunning is they did this to the National Security Advisor of the United States of America, and they did it really at the height. So at the height of the Mueller investigation was when all this was coming to, to a head because, and, and I say the height, it was really the beginning of the Mueller investigation. All the other characters that that now the world knows that came out of the Mueller investigation, the principal character that they needed, because the other guys really, sadly, didn't really matter, but they still were taken to, you know, they were still, their families were, were, were hurt. Um, they really needed a guy like me. So I, then I go through, you know, essentially a couple of years of cooperation and you know, and I think that they they were looking for me to, to give up anything, you know, to say anything. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, I'm one of these very, you know, the, and I hope your audience and hope you get a sense of me talking right now. And I'm one of these very like, you know, I'm a very honest guy. Very, you know, I mean, ask me some if I don't know it. I don't know it. If I if I if I do, I'll tell you, I'm not going to bullshit anybody. Excuse my Irish. But, um, you know, because my business was saving people's lives in the battlefield as a soldier, as a as an intelligence officer, especially as an intelligence officer that, you know, and I served in combat on the battlefield where I was responsible for, you know, the deaths or the lives of people. So uh, my life is not like what they uh, portray it to be. And that's our media. But that's and you, you know this. I mean, I, you know, the people know this. The American people don't trust the institutions of government. They don't trust the media. And they're and they're they're discovering other paths. And that's a sad state of things. And I will tell you, for all of the all of the people that listen to this that are <clears throat> trying to find out if there's some snippet that Mike Flynn gives that, you know, whatever, that they can use against me, um, the more that they do that and the more distrust they bring to themselves, the more the American people have run to my aid and, uh, and to the aid of, oh. of those of us in the country. I'm, I'm going to tell you, I... they don't trust it. They, I can, I can go at Linton, you know, rhyme and verse. They don't trust the intelligence community. They don't trust the Department of Justice. They're now not trusting the Department of Defense. And to a degree, they don't trust our senior military leaders because of this right. debacle in Afghanistan. Right. Nobody can be that incompetent, right? Right. They don't trust, you know, the, the white. I mean, they just trust is such an important uh, commodity. It's the know? glue that holds us together. If we don't have right. faith and trust in the institutions, we don't we really don't have we don't have anything. I, I will tell you, too, that yep. I told Donald Trump this <clears throat> when um, I think it was during Kavanaugh. Uh, I had changed my opinion of Donald Trump because I saw what he was doing and his policies mm-hmm. were not the policies that I thought he was going to implement. They were sound mm-hmm. policies. So I, um, you know, I go on the air and say, I just want to admit I was wrong on this. Thank God I was wrong on this because I thought we were headed for a horror show. <clears throat> and then I saw right. I saw what they were doing to him and then what they were doing to Kavanaugh. And I got on the air and I said, the media is making me a bigger Trump supporter than I've ever been. I mean, right. because it's right. you, you see this injustice and this this vendetta against him so let me ask you on the trump front i have my theories on why he could not be president and everybody thinks the media was so mad at themselves because they helped him get elected i don't think so i think that there is this great reset agenda and donald trump would have never gone along with it and they all had their plans of what the world was going to be like, and he was upsetting that, and he had to go. Why do you think yeah. he was targeted like like no one else has ever been targeted? Like ever, ever. ever. This has never happened in our history, and no. frankly, we are we are our, our nation is going through a massive, massive transition, and we're going to have to make a decision here. You know, if not now, then then very soon about which direction our country goes. So why? Because Trump, you know, Trump was on he as a as a guy out of New York, businessman. He played both sides. You know, one day he could be a good Democrat, one day he could right. be a good Republican. It, de- it depended. So Trump knew 
he knew that sort of depth, you know, of of uh, ugliness within the uh, within that that world of Hollywood, New York media, Washington D.C. You know, he sort of had a very good fingertip feel for what was happening. And he always talked, as everybody knows, he always talked. I'm one of these days. I'm going to get involved in Paul. I'm going to run for president one of these days, and because I think I can fix this, right? I mean, you know, that's that's the that's the mindset mm-hmm. that he had, and so. So Donald Trump decided one day, you know, and I met with him in 2015. Uh, and it was right after he announced. I met with him right in the early days of his of his announcement. And and I will just tell you that when he got involved, it was a joke. It was a big joke. But I will tell you, in all my conversations with Donald Trump, uh, candidate Trump, because I'm one of these guys, you know, I'm a, I'm a stay out of war kind of guy. I'm a military guy. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, everybody that Trump hired after me. We're, we're like of the neocon crowd, right? So I'm not one of these, you know, I'm a, I'm a military guy that's very practical. So we talked about practical things. We talked about practical foreign policy. We talked about trade agreements. We mm-hmm. talked about national, big national security issues. We talked about domestic issues that had a national security bent. So Donald Trump, they knew that Donald Trump was going to come in and not have these radical ideas. He was actually, I mean, he was going to have very common sense, Mm -hmm. very basic American values type ideas. And so what they needed to do is they needed to turn him into this, you know, this womanizing, you know, grotesque figure of a man that was going to that was going to ruin the United States of America. And 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 of course, he's up against the machine, not only the Democratic left machine, but the Clinton machine. And, you know, Hillary Clinton didn't even she didn't really she was kind of like in the Biden mode. But in 2016, she really didn't campaign much in the last couple of weeks of, uh, of 2016 before the election. You know, she didn't go to a couple of states. And because they I think the system was rigged. I, I say it, it was rigged then. It just wasn't the mail in ballot rig. Right. You know, so Trump comes into office and they had to keep beating and beating and beating on him, which they did. And it turns out the guy's actually doing so many good things, you know, reducing, you know, all the different, uh, you know, all the negative factors, and he's increasing all the positive factors, and people are turning around going, wow. And the media kept hammering him for Russia, 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 which is false, false, false. And uh, and then here we are with, because uh, I do have some I do have some things that I think that Trump needs to do now, but I, uh, that he should have done then. And I and and I was not there to help because I one thing that I did have was a good relationship, and I still do, and I still I still think he he would. He would continue to make a great president, as imperfect as he is, mm-hmm. uh, because he's a very practical, sound, uh, you know, policy type guy that looks at common sense. And, you know, let's when he says make America great again, it's all of the different aspects of our lives, you know. Right. But I, I do think that he, he trusted people in his administration, particularly after I left. Uh, and as, as things um, waned into 2019 and 2020, he trusted people, particularly on this COVID issue, and the uh, and the um, you know some of the some of the the people that we now know that were behind uh, what we're facing now. You know, Fauci to be one. Um, you know, and so so there's some there's some people that he listened to that, frankly, Glenn, and this is for your audience. I I hope that you you know as you as you play this out. I don't I don't really pay any attention to the Democrats anymore, and I won't use that word again. I don't I don't pay any attention to that anymore because I know what their game plan is. I know what their I know what their war strategy is. What I worry about, Glenn, is I worry about the Republicans in name only. Mm-hmm. I worry about the Republican establishment and the Republican establishment in this country. They they have lost touch with the base. I right? don't think they've lost touch. I don't think they like the base of the party. Yeah, it's a better way to put it. Yeah, yeah I agree. I completely agree. They. I, you know, as I go around, I just spent I spend these weekends going around to these different rallies that we're having that we're holding with a group of people who care about the country. And we're, you know, we're national security. We're, you know, independent media. We are doctors now because because of the covid uh, nonsense. And I call it the covid confusion. You know, uh, um, so we're going around doing these rallies. And I'm telling you, we have three thousand five. We just had about five thousand. We have twelve thousand showing up. And these are very active. Pe- these are people that are they're they're from all places in the country. They're not just from the flyover states. You know, we did a big rally in in uh, in uh, Anaheim, California, a while, you know, a while ago. We just did one in 
Colorado this, this past weekend. So the, the sentiment of the American people right now is they can, you, you talk about some Republican senator or you talk about the Republican establishment, and I mean, they're like, you know, you should hear the, the, the boos and hisses coming from. Oh, I know. You know, you can, talk about, you can talk about the other side, the left, right? And everybody knows that, that it's, a, it's basically a communist view of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a direction that, is, that we are being dragged by the nose hairs along. And so they don't even care. It's like they care about that. But it's not, they don't see that as the problem. They see the problem. This is America now. This is the American sentiment. And I believe that it's a, I, I, I have a really good feel for this because I've, I've this is my business is to, is to get around mm-hmm. and I, and I, and my intelligence collection, right? My, yeah. my judgment of what I'm seeing in this country. They do not trust, because we talked about trust of institute. They don't trust the Republican establishment anymore. You're exactly right. They really don't because, I mean, Glenn, we lost it. faith there. This, this, we lost faith there before we lost faith in other institutions. They were first. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, let's face it. So we just had this 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 you know, latest hearing in Arizona for the audit. Right now, you know, the media right away. And, and I honestly I don't know where you guys stood on it, but the media, the big media right away said even before the hearing started, they said, well, we you know, nothing to see here. Uh, we had a leaked report, mm-hmm. and uh, Biden won. In fact, he won by more votes than than whatever in in Arizona. Well, you know, actually, I don't even think that there was a leaked report because if there was, I dug around in my network and I I didn't get a leaked report. You know, <laughs> I don't know if you got a leaked report. I didn't get one. Mm-mm. But I but I heard all the nonsense coming out of the media, and so I think that they just made that up. And I think that they then they made up the fact that let's let's beat this before the thing even starts on this Friday afternoon before the hearing even starts. So just one piece of evidence, one piece of evidence that came out of that hearing, there were a million, uh, well, so in late February timeframe, there was a deletion of files, knowing that the subpoena was coming, knowing that the audit was coming. And I believe that they have this on tape, okay, for the person that's out there uh, that did this. They have, actually have this on videotape. Um, so during the hearing, they said there was a million pieces of evidence that were destroyed. Well, federal election law, and there's some statute, you know, 50211 or something like that, if I remember the numbers right, but don't hold me to that, that says every one of those pieces of evidence that was destroyed comes with a $10,000 fine, and I think it's a one-year, uh, you know, uh, uh, in jail. Yeah. I mean, it's all felony. It's a felony. So they did that in February. That was briefed in the hearing. So now you're going to tell me that there was no fraud? And when, when I hear Republicans talking about well, we've had fraud. Like I, I can, I know I can give you some names here, but they've been public about it. But they, they, uh, when they say, well, you know, a little bit of fraud. So yeah, we have fraud in every election. I don't care if it's one dead voter. I agree. You know, I don't care if it's one shadow of ghost. Agree. We should, we cannot have, because that's the other institution. And frankly, so let me, I'll shut up here. Uh, the other institution that nobody in our country has faith in any longer is the institution of our election process, which is the most sacrosanct privilege that we have, because guess what, Glenn, it makes me equal to you on that day, and our vote is supposed to count equally. Well, what we just learned is that it doesn't. Uh, we, have a, we have a massively broken system. It's got to be fixed. And I'm not sure the country can move forward until something until someone is held accountable. I, yeah, I just uh, had this conversation with uh, somebody in the House and they were talking about, you know, the the fraud and the possible thra- fraud and everything else. And we ought to move on. And I said, America cannot move on. It cannot move on. Yeah. It it you must have a legitimate hearing and a legitimate process that is completely transparent and led by leaders of of the community that everybody trusts. You know what I mean? You have yep. to have exactly. a real hearing on this. And I've, I've said this from the beginning. I don't know if there were enough votes to, you know, vote him out of office or keep him in office. I don't know. But I do know this. Something was wrong. Something was very, very wrong. So whether it would have kept him in office or not, I don't know. But that has to be solved. Let me ask you about January 6th, because yeah. um, 
you know, my my stance on this was and quite honestly, you'll never convince me that that was a fair election. I just don't believe it. I just don't believe it. Maybe it was, but I don't believe it. However, when it came to January 6th, there's nothing in the Constitution on January 6th that would have allowed anybody to uh, overturn that and keep him because of the, the Constitution's rules. And it seems unfair mm-hmm. Even if we would, let's say Arizona, we found out it was massive fraud. The Constitution mm-hmm. doesn't uh, afford anything as a remedy to that. Once the president mm-hmm. has been voted by the states and the electors, it's done. And if you don't have that solved by January 20th, um, well, I don't think there is a, if you don't, it it must be done by January 20th. So what did you think on January 6th? And I'm not talking about the, the worst thing since the Civil yeah. War. I'm talking about the what should have been done. The decision. The yeah. Constitutional, the, the constitutional process. Correct. In the, uh, in the Senate. I think that's, that's really the, the, your question. And yes. I think that's an important issue because we have a constitutional process. And it's, it, it, has been, um, it, it has been adjusted, I think, one time where it, it, it was late in March when, uh, and I think this is back in the era of Lincoln. but. Um, but that constitutional process on the 6th of January, the decision was made. The, some tactics that I disagreed with was there were senators that came in in the, in the morning with uh, they were going to vote not to not to certify. And then in the afternoon, because of what happened there, they voted to certify. And I'm not sure. Like, so what changed? What, yeah, that, that you're voting stupid. on so the Constitution or the not. Yeah, right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So that that process that decision was made constitutionally with all of the, the, the right players. And, and so we move forward, right? We move forward as a nation. That doesn't mean, though, that we cannot continue to dig in Correct. to find out if, if this election actually was fraudulent. Because it can't there happen is, again. There's, there's, Glenn, there's hundreds of precedent at other, in other elections, down at, in federal elections and in state elections down below the presidency that have been overturned because of in time more evidence comes out there's court you know there's this sure. fight somebody doesn't somebody doesn't concede and they fight for the seat the gal up in uh, up in New York 22 and I forget her name now but she she continued to fight and she won the seat you know because she found that there was fraud in uh, in her particular election in the, in the in the New York congressional uh, race as part of the the 3 November so so there, now, now what we're talking about though is we're we're talking about the presidency and the media is beating up on everybody and, and calling and, you know, calling yep. us all conspiracy theorists like like you saying, well, you're a conspiracy theorist. If you believe that the three November election was fraudulent, I believe it wasn't done properly. I do. I do. I actually don't care whether in fact, I'm, this is not about Trump. I mean, I'll get out there and I'll say yeah, Trump was a great president. I'm, I, I support the guy. I still support the guy. But this is an American issue. Yep. And I said earlier. That America is at a massive transition point, right? And that transition point is we are going to go down a path of socialism or communism, or we're going to go down this path of this continuation of the experiment in democracy called the Constitutional Republic. I don't really care about Trump because all of us are a blip on the historic screen of life of this country. If we want to continue to last, you know, for, for 200 more years as a constitutional republic, we have got to get this resolved. You know, Amen. to have a fraudulent election at a congressional district and get it overturned, that's one thing. But we're talking about the presidency. I ain't talking about President Trump right now. Yep. I'm talking about the presidency of the United yep. States of America. Yep. And I can tell you from an American, as an American, as a as a guy who still I mean, I grew up in a in a in a you know, I'd love to just talk about my family. But I grew up in a in a in a tough family. And, and my father retired as a sergeant from the army, 20 year Vet, World War II, Korea, Irishman, right? I mean, and, and our, our life was kicking rear and as, you're, as he was getting you out of bed in the morning because you were trying to oversleep and he's telling you, go deliver the newspapers at five o'clock. What I'm telling you is that the American people do not trust what happened. And I will, and the other thing that I would say is that nobody voted for, the, for what we are facing right now. We're facing, I think we're somewhere between five and 6% uh, um, inflation rate. We've got you know, the, the gas down the street from my house is, I think, three dollars more than when it was a year ago. I mean, 
you know, I'm, we're paying a couple extra dollars, you know, in for a gallon of milk. You know, we, you know, there's jobless. I mean, there's a lot of things happening that we say to ourselves as Americans, I didn't vote for this. I didn't vote for this at all. And that's where the sentiment of the American people out there, that's what, they, that's what they feel. That includes, that includes, I think, Glenn, probably, probably half of the other party. You know, I really do believe that there's a lot of sleepers out there now that go, ooh, wait a second. I'm not sure I, you know, I have remorse now. I have, remor- you know, voters remorse. Yeah. Um, but I, 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 I hope you're right. I'll, I, I'll, 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 one, one of the things that I saw yeah. that I thought was very hopeful was during this dishonorable uh, debacle in Afghanistan that America collectively woke up. And and to me, that shows that there is still a Judeo-Christian ethic out there of honor and integrity and tell the truth. And we don't see it very often. But that was so shocking to the American people that we would leave our own behind and leave our friends behind. I think that uh, I, I, th- I think that said good things about the American people, yeah. horrible things about our ruling class. Yeah. I, so I'll just briefly well, talk about Afghanistan, because what I what did I feel when that happened, when all that, not just the attack, but how we were leaving and then the attack happened, yeah. you know, the, the attack against these 13 brave souls uh, who, who um, you know, uh, it's just so sad. I was actually irritated with our military more than I was with the White House because I just know the the incompetency of the people there, literally the incompetency, because I know these people. So wait, 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 I want to I want to let's let's dive into this carefully, because I people tell me that uh, Joe Biden is not really there. He's not in control of his faculties. I'm not sure that's entirely true. Uh, I think he has, you know, maybe non lucid moments, but. I think he knew about this, and I think the um, the leadership at the Pentagon knew exactly what it was going to cost, but they didn't have the balls to do anything different. Yeah, it, how accurate yeah. is I that? Mean, it's, I mean, we're not that. I think it's very accurate. I think that we're we're not that stupid. The military is not that stupid. This is tactics one hundred and one. They teach these kind of case studies of how to how to do these kinds of op- military operations in in infantry, you know, career courses for young officers. I mean, so we're not, we're not that incompetent uh, at all. So there's got to be a level of knowledge and complicity is a really strong word to use here. Um, I, let, me, let me just uh, go back one second on the, uh, on the American people, the honor and that you talked about. Um, I also think that the American people are still the most forgiving. Yes. And, and if, if we do something wrong... And you write and you and you admit it, right? You say, oh, I did something wrong. I'm sorry. You know, I, I, I wasn't thinking or whatever. Uh, you know, the American people will, will forgive. I agree. Uh, so Afghanistan, I think that's a big deal. I think I think forgiveness is one of the biggest character traits of the American mm-hmm. citizen. Um, one of the greatest strengths that we have is the ability to forgive, not forget, but forgive. Afghanistan is an unforgiving uh, uh, debacle. And the American people are not going to let this one go uh, because we still have American citizens. And I, I know this for a fact I that are left too. behind, uh, you know, enemy lines. And, and I know you're, you're helping out in an extraordinary way. And I, and I appreciate that, uh, you know, if, if from just a one, from a guy who served over there a long period of time and know what, how horrendous these people are that we're facing. Um, but there, you know, there's these efforts to get these, uh, these brave, Americans out of there who are just our friend, our our nation surrendered. We retreat. We surrendered to the Taliban. We retreated under fire, uh, and and we we uh, basically left American citizens behind enemy lines. I mean, that's the only way I can say it. Again, we're not that stupid. We're not that incompetent. So there's a level of complicity here that's really dangerous. I, I so so why you know why? Let, let me just give you my minute on that. I. I think why is because part of it is, I think, when we talk about institutions and faith in institutions, the last bastion of integrity, and I think that the American people still have faith in, is our military. Mm-hmm. I really believe that. I have to believe it. Because moms and dads are still sending their sons and daughters to serve, but not in droves anymore. And I'm going to be paying very close attention to our recruiting numbers here this year and next year, because I think it's, they're going to be down. 
because of what just happened. Oh, yeah. Um, so I think that this administration actually wants to put a body blow into the military's uh, integrity and into the military, uh, is, you know, <laughs> the confidence that the American people have in the military. I actually think that that's I mean, I don't I can't understand. I can't explain it in any other way so other I, than to say this. General, ahead. you are I, I mean, I'm sorry, I have tried to give the benefit of the doubt. But again, something, if it was a mistake, if it was, you know, not intentional, occasionally things would break to the American side. But everything that is being done is destroying us or the institutions. It's dividing us. You couldn't you couldn't come up with a better plan. You just couldn't. Yeah. Glenn, I was on the phone the other day, Saturday, I believe, early Saturday morning. Uh, so this is Monday, early Saturday morning, whatever that date is, the 24th, maybe, um, of, Fe- of uh, September, with a friend who was on his way, and he was, he was at the, really, he was at the Del Rio Bridge in Texas, mm. where the Haitians were, right? Mm-hmm. Because I'm, bringing, I'm, I'm, I'm breaking an analogy of what it is that we're talking about now with Afghanistan. And so he got down there. And he said, you're not going to believe this. He goes, they're all gone. So remember the pictures of Friday, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. all last week mm-hmm. of these Haitians underneath the, mm-hmm. he goes, they're gone. And I said, what do you mean they're gone? He goes, yeah, they must have pulled them out of here last night. Because we're not seeing those pictures anymore, right? Because mm-hmm. the, 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 uh, and the, the administration is, you know, will tell you, I think, I think what they're going to try to say is, well, we pushed them all back. No, they didn't. They put them on planes, trains, and automobiles, and they yep. shipped them all over the country because they yep. didn't want that. They didn't want that media attention anymore. Mm-hmm. And this was a guy that was going down there to do some, he was going to get down there and do some investigation and some work to see what they, what, how he could help. Yeah, they're gone. He says, they're gone. I said, what the hell do you mean they're gone? He goes, they're gone. There's no, there's, there's just trash down here. It's trashed. And now I, I was told this morning, in fact, a few minutes before coming on your show, that we're now looking at about another 100,000 people from multiple countries that are on their way up the, uh, up through Mexico now to come to the border again. You know, I, I lived, I, I was stationed at Fort Huachuca, Arizona, which is a border, which is federal property, a military installation. It's a home of the Army Intelligence Center and School. And I was stationed there multiple times, particularly in the, you know, not, not you know, right, right before the war started 20 years ago. And we used to have 10,000 illegals a month crossing federal property at that time. That was 2002, 2004 time frame. I mean, so... When we look at Afghanistan and we look at the decision making that happened there and we look at the decision making that's happening at our own border, because the border is a the reason there's a reason why we put locks on doors. There's a reason why we put walls up around our fences, up around our our neighborhoods. Right. Because you want to keep people out and you want to keep things, the right things in. And so we we have a, a, a White House because I agree with you. I'm not a doctor. I mean. You know, does does Joe Biden look like he doesn't know what's going on sometimes? Yeah, he does. Absolutely. Does he go off a script? Yeah, he does. I, you know, I'm not a doctor to diagnose his mental health, mm-hmm. but but the decisions, the decision making. And I served at the highest level of our government to support decision making. We made decisions early on before I did get out of it. The, the you know before I did have to depart the White House. Um, so I, I know what that means, and the decisions being made by this White House are really just decisions that are so against the American psyche and so against the fabric of our Constitution. And I actually think that they're they're working towards, as I said, a transition towards a different form of government in this country. And you've been talking about this for a long time, Glenn. We, we, we can't <laughs> no, kid ourselves anymore. It's, uh, it's too late to kid yourself about it. Um, let me talk about General Milley for a second. Um, you know, he made a phone call to China and said, hey, listen, we're not going to attack. If something like that would come up, I'll call you in advance. That's not the kind of conversation that the Logan Act came gunning for you on. Where does that fall uh, to you as a general for Millie to make that phone call to talk about an attack um, while the president was, it's not a transition. The president was, was seated at the time. He was working for that president. Duly elected president. He's yeah. a duly elected president of the United States of America. Mark Milley is the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And staff is a key word, and I'll say why here in a second. By law, is the senior 
uh, military advisor to the president of the United States of America. And, and our, the beauty of our constitution has placed the military as a subordinate to the, to the, uh, to the political class of our country, to the president, right? That's why that one of the hats that the president wears is, is, is the uh, commander in chief. Correct. So for Milley to have done what he did, he was usurping the authority. He was breaking the law. He was in violation of the law, really. Uh, but he was usurping the authority of the duly elected president of the United States at the time, Donald J. Trump. And and he was basically, you know, indicating, giving our giving our enemy, you know, the military. We don't look at we don't look at the at, as China as a competitor like uh, the Commerce Department would or as a colleague as the State Department would. We're the military. Our business is to fight and win our nation's wars and not to you know, not to pussyfoot around. So for, for Milley to have called up his counterpart and say, hey, don't worry, if we attack, I'm going to call you, you know, and for Trump to find out about this after the fact, because obviously he's just he's finding out about this conversation that Milley had just recently, you know, in the in because of this book that's out. I mean, Milley should should he should resign the fact that that came out. He should re- throw his stars down and say, I'm you know, not throw his stars down. He should he should, you know, humbly hand them into somebody. Um, we, we cannot. Uh, again, back to the American people. The American people, Mark, that's Mark's, that's Millie's first name. The American people, Mark, do not have faith and confidence in you any longer because of what we just discovered. And you have not come out and denied it. He has not come out and denied it. And I know Mark Millie. I've known him for a long time. I know Lloyd Austin. I actually know Lloyd Austin better than I know Mark Millie. And I, I'm, I, I know these guys. This is this is not good for. The Constitution of the United States of America, which is what we I, I adhere to, it's not good for the presidency, uh, it's not good for the military, and it's not good for the people of this country because the people of this country, when they start to have, when they start to lose faith in our in our uniform, those who wear the cloth of the military and our uniform service members at the senior level, when they lose faith, they no longer send their sons and daughters to serve our country. That's dangerous because that's not only about the health of of the institution of the military, it's the health of the institution of our country. If we don't have young men and young women who are willingly uh, will willingly sign on the dotted line and give their lives for you and I to have this kind of a conversation, of you know, a, a, a public discourse about uh, what's what's happening in our country, we're we're in trouble, Glenn. We're in trouble, Glenn, with our with that uh, element of our of our government, that institution of our government, when people start to lose faith in the leaders of our military. Well, you know, it's, it's, set aside the, the, the political It's not people. just a losing faith in the military, the American people. Um, it is also all of our allies. I mean, I, I can't imagine. Can you imagine the prime, what would happen if you were still national security advisor and the president refused to take a phone call from the British prime minister. Would you have known about it? How many people would have known that for 40 hours the British prime minister was trying to reach the right. president? Everybody, everybody in the White House, everybody in the inner circle, because I can tell you from a national security advisor's perspective, believe me, those relationships are, are uh, extraordinary and they're, they have to be open and honest between national security advisors of different countries, and I, I spoke to uh, I spoke to damn near every national security advisor of the of, of probably half the world, Glenn, going into that job. You know, the one that comes out is the you know, of course, my 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 conversation with the ambassador of uh, of Russia, right? That's like, oh my God, but so yeah, so everybody around the president would know that is in a key position, chief the chief of staff, the national security advisor, the secretary of defense, the secretary of state would all have been receiving phone calls from their counterparts saying. You know, WTH, right? Instead of the other one, WTH. Yeah. Uh, what's going on there? What's happening? We're we are we are seriously concerned. So, so um, that's that's another ugly episode of American leadership. And I use the word leadership, uh, you know, in a really unsatisfying way uh, because. That's what we're up against. I mean, that's what we're fa- we're facing a, a group of people. Talk about cabals and the use of word cabals, right? Cabals for the Great Reset. The cabal inside of the White House right now, and that includes Susan Rice. We have not mentioned. Yep. I have not mentioned her name, Susan Rice. So she's in there as a 
as a assistant to the president of the United States for for God knows what. She's got a title, but boy, I, I think she's doing a lot more. And that, so anyway, I just mm. she'd be another one. People would be calling all these different key people to say, hey, we, we need some help here. And then and then, you know, not to mention this issue with the with this nuclear issue out in the Pacific with the Australians and where the French got upset. Right. I mean, these are big, big deals with our alliances and our partnerships and our, and our friend, those, those who are friendly to us around the world, um, who are starting to see what's happening to America. And, and they're, and they're, I'll tell you what's going to happen. What's going to happen, Glenn, is when the going gets tough and it's going to get worse here, Glenn, the the sacrifices are going to be greater going forward than they are. And we've already, that we've already felt. So when the going gets tough, these alliances will turn on us and they'll turn on us quickly, uh, particularly with this crowd that's in the White House right now, um, because a lot of America feels they're illegitimate. I think that these leaders are, are around the world, at least the ones that have that have kept any legitimacy with their own people, uh, they, they look at they look at what's going on and they're like, oh, man, we, we can't deal with these guys, especially if they're not being honest, forthright, if they're not returning our calls. And we've right. been with them for years. So anyway, tell me about China. I'm I'm. I mean, they are playing chess and we're not even playing checkers. Uh, we, yeah. we're, we're, yeah. we're playing hopscotch at some other playground. Um, China is yeah. making overtures. They're, they're playing. So if you want, yeah. 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 So because I know I know because of time. But so the big winner, OK, the big winner for your audience and, and for anybody that watches this on any social media, the big winner is China. So the big winner, the last century was a U.S. century. China made a, China made a commitment that this century was going to be the century of, of China. Okay, that's big strategic 60,000 foot level. Yep. Big winner in Afghanistan, China. The big winner on the, on the global stage right now, China. China. So the, the Chinese military is actually, is they're on, they're, they are starting to be on a footing with the U.S. military. Why? Because they've stolen a lot of our technology and they just rebuilt it. They've stolen the blueprints to make Drones. They've stolen the blueprints to make anti-aircraft weapon systems. They've stolen the blueprints to make jets. I mean, guarantee that that kind of stuff has happened. So, and they and they are smart. They are inside of our federal government. They're inside of our education system. And this didn't happen because of Donald Trump. This has been going on for the better part of a of probably four or five decades. So I can tell you, it's been going on for at least the last two and a half decades. And I can I can almost pinpoint. The time frame when it when it really began in earnest in the 90s in the, in the mid to late 90s. So, um, so China's the big winner uh, right now. We have to, um, you know, we have to really pay close attention, Glenn. Uh, I, I think that there's any legitimacy to anybody that's still in our government that still feels, you know, that they they have a uh, uh, any 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 passion for our constitution and they're in a senior position in our U.S. government. You know, they need to they need to come. They need to step up and and uh, and and speak out uh, and be brave because the American people want accountability and the American people, they they not only deserve this, but they are leadership positions. And that's courage, selfless courage, you know, with a with an element of humility uh, that we need in our country mm-hmm. right now. But we're, we're really we're really in a, We're in a tough spot. I'm not going to hold back. We're in a tough spot, Glenn. And you, you, you know, you, you talk about this all the time. You've been talking about it for a long time. You know, even in your case, and you know, and and play it or not, but the media try and the and the and the left tries to buttonhole who you are, right? You've been through this. I've 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 been I've been you know watching your career and watching what you've done in the media. And actually, you bring us you bring an element, a huge element of honesty and forthrightness and no nonsense, no bullshit to the media. And I, I, don't, and I in this first media interview we've had, I, we've never yeah, met. Never met. I'm just telling you that I know, I know what our country is feeling right now. I do. And I feel it because I'm just a regular guy. I, I made it to general through a public university. Okay. I'm not a West Point guy. I worked my ass off and I deployed. I took the hard jobs that nobody else wanted. And so, you know, I'm an Irish kid from a, from a, a family of nine and my father, and like I said, I wasn't kidding. He used to kick us in the rear end and get us. He'd throw us out of bed. He did the old throw up the throw up the uh, the mattress, like he probably did in many barracks, right, to his own kids. 
So uh, I'm just telling you that we're in a difficult spot. The American people know it. But what they're looking for is, OK, what do I do? What can I do? And I'll leave you with this. My phrase that I have uh, that I have jumped on is local action has a national impact. Yep. So when I go out and I talk to people, I say, quit complaining about Washington, D.C., quit complaining about your state's capital and your governor. What are you doing? You know, what are you doing? Like the old John F. Kennedy, you know, what, what are you doing for your country? Right. What are you doing for your town? What are you doing for your family? Get, get involved. Local action has a national impact. I do believe that that's one weapon system that we still have in our arsenal of millions and millions of millions of, of really of this sort of because you did highlight it. This, there's, a, there's a Christian element in our country that still exists. And they're not people that wear their faith on their sleeve. You know, so there are some of those. But there's, 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 a, there's hundreds of millions of us that are, that are, uh, that are really um, ready. And, they, and so my message, get involved. Local action has a national impact. If your school board is teaching critical race theory, and they're teaching filth and pornography to our 10-year-olds in elementary school, don't complain to me about your school board. You voted for them in. Go run for school board Amen. the next time around. Go, or, or don't show up with three people. Show up with 3,000 to the next school board hearing, right? You got me on my soapbox. Local action, let, national impact. Let me, let me close with this question. I know we're running late. Um, but I, in 1972, something happened in your life. A little girl climbed into a car. And I don't believe that a man who starts out in 1972 like this, that that ripple doesn't go all the way through your life to today. Um, and I can't imagine. Uh, I just I just don't believe any of the dishonorable stuff that the media tries to place on you and it must kill you. Tell the audience what happened to yeah, you in yeah. 1972. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up. I mean, 1972, we were with a bunch of, I was a kid, you know, I was born in 1958, so I was 14, maybe. I was a kid. Uh, we were playing out in front of, in a front yard with some, with some friends in a neighborhood, and a car uh, was, the kids were playing in the car, a brake was released, there was two children playing at the bottom of a, of a long driveway, cars starts to roll, and so I, there was the two children were there and there was a car that they were playing at that was parked at the bottom of the driveway and mm. both those kids would have likely been crushed. And so I, I, I yelled, I moved quickly, you know, uh, probably instinct more than anything else. G had another kid, another kid there and I said, grab, you know, her and these children, we grabbed them. And, you know, long story short, my hometown, um, you know, made a nice, you know, they made a nice gesture to say thank you for saving these children. And so I, I appreciate you bringing that. I don't, I don't, you know, talk about that kind of stuff, but, but, it, um, I, I think my life, I define who I am, Glenn, you know, my wife and I actually, my wife and I have been together since I was since 1972, wow. okay, since we were 13 years wow. old, been married for over 40 years now. Yeah. So, you know, everything in my life is about loyalty to something and someone and now, and it, and it grew in time to being loyal to this country as I understood it more, especially as I joined the military. So I, I just you know, appreciate you bringing that up. Um, you know, I tell people now, don't let anybody else define you. If you look at yourself in the mirror and you're not the same person walking away from it, then you got a problem. Mm. Uh, I define who I am. I don't really give a shit about the, military, <laughs> about the media and what they, what, how they, how, you know, how they define me. I really don't. My mom was one of these this extraordinary woman, you know, thank God she had nine children. Um, my mom used to say, you know, the old sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. So, you know, get back out and play in the street kind of thing, you know? And, um, that's, that's what I believe. And I, that's who I am and that's who I will be. And, you know, they can say what they want. Uh, media can say what they want. Actually, the more they attack me, I actually, in some funny way, I guess I say, you know, be, be my guest because the American people, keep coming to me. Mm. And I so deeply appreciate the American people who came to the rescue of my family and I, both morally and financially, uh, to help us get through these last uh, number of years of just pure political persecution. God bless you. Thank you, General.
Thanks, Glennon. Appreciate your audience. God bless your audience and God bless all that you do for this country. Thank, Thank you. you.